haircut. My skin is terrible. I'm filming at night and my notes are tethered to the power cord because I'm not prepared and found out my tablet had zero percent battery when I went to go film this. But if I don't film this now, it will not happen. So we're going to roll with it. Hello and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast. I am your host, the Freakish Lemon. I go by Adrian. I use masculine pronouns. Welcome to any new viewers. Thank you so much for clicking on whatever you clicked on to get here. And welcome back any returning viewers. Thank you so much for putting up with this month after month. I really appreciate it. This is a Crafty Type podcast coming to you from an area that includes part of the Tunxes, Pagusset, and Mohican homelands in Northwest Connecticut. And this podcast has closed captioning and transcriptions are available in the show notes, which can be found over at freakishlemon.com. Uh, we also have a group on Ravelry. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab and you will find us. You can follow me at all the fun places like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Ravelry as Freakish Lemon. And all the links to those things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And, uh, if you do want to follow along with this thing, despite how frazzled this episode is, uh, feel free to click that little subscribe button here on YouTube to follow along with what I am doing. I am filming this Friday, July 19th, 2019. And usually I start out with podcast stuff, but I we're starting out with real talk today. Real talk has three bullet points. One, Ravelry. Since my last episode, Ravelry has updated. I'm going to be reading from my tablet a little bit here because I write better than I speak. Uh, Ravelry has updated their terms of service to be more strict with prohibiting hate speech and white supremacy, which I fully support. There has been a lot of emotional labor involved in the Black, Indigenous, and people of color on Ravelry to make Ravelry safer for... I've lost the word I'm looking for. I wrote this a little weird. The Ravelry thing is not the most important thing on this list, but they, there's been a lot of emotional labor involved to make the site safer for Black and Indigenous and people of color. Um, that was grammatically incorrect. Uh, and I'm glad to see that Ravelry was listening to those folks who were pushing to make Ravelry a better site. So hooray. Uh, here's the meat of real talk. Uh, Nathan Taylor and Benjamin Till. This, in this essay, I will outline the events of what happened because a lot of things have been removed from Instagram and also provide some observations. Get ready. Uh, it's long. <laughs> I will try to keep it as succinct as possible and try not to go off script too much. Um, if I trip over myself, it's because I've written something grammatically incorrect and I'm trying to fix it in my brain and the brain is gone. Um, so first thing, Nathan made a post last week uh, on Instagram, tone policing black indigenous and people of color under the diverse nitty hashtag. Uh, when called out and educated on his post, Nathan closed comments and edited most of the text of that post. Sidebar bullet points. I posted about this on Instagram, but I saw a troubling amount of silence from white folks regarding his post. There was also an unsurprisingly large fan base supporting his tone policing. Uh, his post was damaging and irresponsible, but I was not surprised by it. Uh, Nathan is an openly gay man with HIV, which is not at the top of the privilege ladder, but he is a white cisgendered man in an affluent country who, from what he presents to us online, 
does not live on or below the poverty line. Those are a lot of things that boost him closer to the top of that privilege ladder. I have seen him more than once equate his struggles as a gay man with the struggles of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and non-cisgendered folks, so it didn't surprise me when people pointed out how his words were harmful to Black, Indigenous, people of color in particular, and provided resources for him to educate himself, he shut down the thread. Uh, there are screenshots of his original text of the post and of Nathan's and his husband's responses in the comments available on Instagram. Um, if you have not seen them and need to be directed, feel free to DM me. If I've got the brain space, I will point you in the right direction. If I don't already have those things, in a highlight stories thing on my account. Back to the timeline. Benjamin Till, Nathan's husband, posted to Nathan's account saying that he had to be hospitalized and placed the blame on people calling out the racism in the prior post. He continued to engage and encourage racist behavior and language in the comments of that post. Benjamin then shut down his own Instagram account and had posted multiple times to an external blog which had included detailed graphic descriptions of his husband's mental breakdown and calls to action against Black and Indigenous people of color uh, who commented on Nathan's account, singling out specific Instagram users. Sunday, July 14th, 2019, Nathan made an appearance at Yarningham, Yarningham, uh, netting festival in Birmingham, UK. If the festival information is wrong, but it is Yarningham is the festival. Uh, to sell books and teach workshops, which had been in contract prior to his inflammatory posts on Instagram. Uh, despite his recent hospitalization, when he was approached at the book table by a woman of color and asked questions about his post, he attacked her, had to be physically restrained, and had to be removed from the event. This is appalling and violent, and this is why Black, Indigenous, people of color do not feel safe in majority white spaces. Uh, this is a quote from what I wrote on Instagram after the news of the attack happened. Uh, white supremacy is an infection. It's everywhere just slowly seeping in. We need to crack ourselves open and carve it out. Um, there are many ways to do that and the amazing uh, black indigenous people of color um, I, I wrote the acronym as a descriptor instead of a noun, so it's not great grammatically in my notes. I'm sorry if I'm making a face. Um, there are many ways to do that, and the amazing Black, Indigenous, people of color in this community have been handing us the means to do it uh, with books, workshops, videos, and posts on how to use our power, patronage, donations, words, and voices to make change and hold ourselves accountable. There has been, and still is, a lot of disappointing silence from white makers, podcasters, and businesses uh, in response to Nathan and Benjamin's behavior. It took physical violence against a woman of color before a lot of people even started to see a problem, and this is not okay. It's not okay. Bullet point number three is related to bullet point number two about Nathan and Benjamin. Online responsibility. I also want to make a point about taking responsibility for your audience and social media, on social media and other spaces online. Uh, for comparison, these are my numbers. YouTube. 1,389 subscribers, Instagram, 732 followers, Tumblr, 369 followers, 
Twitter 187 followers. If you pretend that there's no overlap in those numbers, that's 2,677 people. That's enough people to nearly fill the Danbury Ice Arena in Danbury, Connecticut. Nathan has over 20,000 followers on Instagram and over 17,000 subscribers on YouTube. His Instagram followers alone could fill Madison Square Garden. His behavior regarding not taking responsibility for how his audience will use his words is a serious problem. This is a problem that I've seen time and again on YouTube and Instagram as people become online celebrities since the first YouTube mega celebrities back in 2008. When you have those numbers, posting to YouTube and Instagram is not hanging out with a few friends in someone's living room. When you have my numbers, it's not just hanging out with a few friends in someone's living room. I know it feels like that when it's you and a camera, but it isn't. When you have those numbers, anything you post is an announcement to a stadium full of people. It is so easy for that amount of people, even if each one saw the post or video alone, to mob, to jump to conclusions, to react in a way that they never would if someone said an ignorant or hurtful thing one-on-one. -on -one. It's okay to make mistakes. Offhand Twitter comments and troublesome language is going to happen. When it's pointed out to you, feel your feelings in private, and then stop to think about it. Reach out to people who are volunteering the emotional labor to educate you. And if they are willing, discuss the situation with them. Admit your mistakes. Own that you messed up. And clarify your mistake and what you have learned from it. It is okay to change your mind on things. This is how we learn and grow. But when Black, Indigenous, and people of color point out how your words to 20,000 people are going to hurt them, and your response is, I don't care about that, that is irresponsible, entitled, and damaging to the community that you insist that you are trying to improve. All right, I'm going to ask you, viewer who is watching this video, to pause this video, ignore that motorcycle, and feel your feelings about what I just said. Just feel your feelings. If you need to come back to this video tomorrow, turn it off. The crafting is still going to be here. But I think these are important things to consider and feel and acknowledge what emotions you're feeling when you listen to those words that I just said. And if you are confused by anything that I just said, feel free to ask me a question. Um, I'm not the quickest person to respond to comments, but I usually eventually respond to comments. So when you're ready, come back. We'll start talking about the crafting. I'll drink some water because it's hot. Okay, we're good. You felt all your feelings. 
you've internalized what you needed to think about, let's get on to the crafting. Dye stuff. I did some more dye stuff over the past couple of weeks. Um, lichen dye. I have had a jar with lichen in it sitting in an ammonia and water solution since mid-December. And uh, I decided that was going to be a solar dye because that was a stinky dye. So I did not want to heat that up in my craft room and breathe it. So I filled up a big jar that's reserved only for dyeing things and um, dumped in my lichen dye solution. I did an 8% alum fixative on my fiber samples and left it in the sun for about a week. And these are what they look like. As per usual, the wool took color really well. It's kind of soft yellow. My lights are especially bright today because it's dark outside, so everything's going to be a little blown out. We're going to deal with it. Uh, the cotton is slightly yellow, but not a whole lot. And then the cotton and linen are just kind of off-white, uh, which is not unusual for natural dye samples. I apologize if my face gets more red as we go because it is hot and my fans are on low so that you do not have all the ambient noise in the world. Because there's no air conditioning in this bedroom. I also had going a purple basil dye. I have been growing purple basil, or it's called red basil, I'm not sure, and I read somewhere you could die with it, so my poor little purple basil plants have been being eaten by bugs, so most of what I've been harvesting is not the best for consumption, so I've been saving it, I put a bunch of it into a jar, about 50 grams of it into a jar with some water, put it in the sun for about a week. Um, did the 8% alum fixative on the fiber samples. I only did the yarns. I did a, a BFL and a cotton yarn um, just because I didn't think I was going to get very much color out of that purple basil. Um, so let me show you the wool first. This coloring right here is not from the basil. I was reclaiming some yarn from some old projects that I wasn't using very much and uh, one of the yarns bled <laughs> onto this while they were drying on my drying rack. So that little bit of reddish color there is from another skein of yarn. It's mostly this kind of green gray, which is interesting. And then this cotton yarn has faded a bit, but it was more of the lightest, lightest lavender. Um, and these lights are pretty blue, so I don't know if it'll show up at all, but. If needed, I can always over dye it again, but it's, um, I'm pretty happy with how this one turned out. I'm surprised at this color, but I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. And if I need to, I'll over dye this one. Did I say how long the basil was in there for? Uh, the fiber samples were in there for about five days in the sun. They might have needed to stay in there longer, but I ended up bringing home some other plants before people mowed their abandoned lots to die with that I wanted to do solar dyeing, so I needed to empty those jars. I also did some eco printing, which was pretty cool. Um, better results this time than last time. I used the same fabric that I used last time because nothing really showed up on it at all. Um, 
So what do I need to say about... I didn't do any fixative on this fabric this time around. I used oak leaves, maple leaves, ferns, sumac leaves, and sumac berries, some Queen Anne's lace, and sprinkled some calendula petals as my eco printing materials. And most of those things have tannins in them that will fix a dye. Uh, I used two, I think they're two yard cuts or yard and a half cuts of, um, linen. It's either a linen or a linen rayon. My notes are terrible. Uh, I gotta go through my note notebook. I wrote my show notes from what I could remember. Um, so I did two of those samples at an equal number of plant types in each one. I folded one up into like a cube and I rolled one up as a cylinder. So the one I folded up into a cube is this one. And this one I, I wet the fabric, put the plant stuff on it, folded it up into a cube. And then I put it into a tea dye solution. I used 12 tea bags of English breakfast tea and got this lovely dark. It doesn't look dark on camera because my lights are so bright, but you can see the fold lines there. Um, but I did get some black and gray dye impressions. They're not very clear impressions. Are there any on this one where you can tell where the leaves are? Oh, there's a leaf. I found a maple leaf. <laughs> They're not very clear impressions, especially since like the sumac berries, I just kind of like chopped them off the cone thing and just like let them fall where they will. I wasn't really careful about this at all. So a lot of stuff shifted around. Um, but it is a pretty cool fabric to look at. I will be taking a lot more um, photos of the interesting impressions on this fabric. Um, when I find the time. Um, but that was successful. I'm pretty pleased with how that turned out. And then I did the cylinder one in a coffee dye bath. I did 50 grams of ground coffee that I got at Ocean State Job Lot. It was nearing its expiration date when I bought it, but I wasn't going to be drinking it, so I figured I might as well take that one home. And this one, the impressions are clearer. You can see there's a leaf, a maple leaf, and you can see where individual sumac berries fell. Um, For this one, it's like the concentration of the tannins was darker, but the coffee dye was lighter, which is interesting um, and something to keep note of for the future. And my show notes fell asleep. Um, and this piece of fabric is much more symmetrical than the other one because of the rolling because I folded it in half and then rolled it up so like you can see leaves there on the sumac branch yeah anyway 
it looks like ink everywhere. Um, which is really interesting and was really cool to do. Um, probably something that I will sporadically experiment with. Um, but I don't know. It was fun to do, but I don't know what I will do with this much fabric. Maybe I'll start working with some smaller ones. Um, this way I don't have to look for that much dye material for the eco printing and just kind of do fat quarter sized experiments instead of giant pieces of fabric. Um, but I'm glad I was able to get some cool stuff onto this fabric since it was kind of a dud when I did it in December because I didn't know what I was doing and I still don't, but middle of December is not the best time to try natural dyeing. I don't know. Um, and then because I had those pots of tea and coffee dye, I threw in um, a skin of these BFL tweeds. This is the tea and this is the coffee. I was surprised that the coffee one came out lighter, but I really like this tea color. And this is the second go in the dye pot, which is interesting. I left the tea bags in there, so the tea bags probably pressed up against the yarn, which is how you get that variegation. But that's pretty cool. Here's the coffee one, which is a lighter color. And then I also did a third dye bath. Um, I put some previously attempted dyed hand spun in the tea. It looks exactly the same. I put some cotton scraps in the coffee. They look slightly beige. They're not that exciting and they're still wet and drying downstairs, so I didn't grab them. Uh, which is it for dyeing. Um, I do have plant matter cooking outside. It'll be real cooked uh, over the next couple of days because it's going to be a hundred degrees outside. So that'll be good. I'll play with that uh, in a few weeks, I guess. So let's move on to finished objects. I have some hand spun that I finished. I have finished uh, my Darth Scabrous little batlings. Um, drop spindling, I used a Turtle Made Top World Drop Spindle and the Classy Squid Top World Drop Spindle. I applied these on another drop spindle that I have. It's heavier, but it holds more fiber on it. Um, this ended up being 197.7 grams. Uh, I measured it at about 8 wraps per inch, about 312 yards. My hand spun measurements are not the most accurate, but um, yeah, so it's about a, an Aran weight. Heavy worsted, which is pretty typical of my hand spinning, not hand spinning, drop spindling, um, hand spun weight. But that's exciting because I've had these forever. And then I had a little bit left of the fiber that I did my sweater spin out of. A while back I put it on the drum carter to practice um, with a little bit of Angelina or Stellina, some kind of shiny thing, um, and made little batlings out of it. So this is what's left. Um, about 64 grams, 10 wraps per inch, 160 yards. It's a two ply. So is the other one. I don't do anything other than a two ply on the drop spindles. That's too many plies for me to drop spindle. Or anything more than that is too many plies for me to drop spindle, is what I mean. 
And then I have two sewing finished objects. Uh, both were fairly quick, um, although one was quicker than the other. I, on the 4th of July, the day before the 4th of July, Joann's was having fabric sale. I had stopped in for something else, but um, I saw that um, children's knits were on sale for very cheap. So I got this dragon and castle fabric and I made myself a tank top. This is a modified version of the Lago tank top by Itch to Stitch um, with the neckline raised. And then I did true facings where I traced um, a section out of the pattern pieces instead of doing the bands that you normally do. I think I did I did things out of order because I've never done facings before, but I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. And it's going to be real hot, so I'm real excited to wear uh, my new ridiculous dragon tank top. And then I made the so liberated forager vest because sometimes the pants that I wear outside in the garden do not have pockets which you need pockets in the garden because you need pockets um I'm growing herbs out there so every time I go out there I'm like oh I gotta pick more basil and then I end up just like carrying it in my shirt like a makeshift basket so I made this so I could put basil in my pockets um, so this I made I made it to the pattern except for a couple of things uh, each of these pieces um, is made up of several naturally dyed um, fabric samples. They're all the linen and linen rayon blend fabric samples. Um, I did flat felled seams to piece them together. And then as I was doing that, I decided I wasn't going to do regular seams um, for the shoulders or the sides. I was going to do flat felled seams for those two, which is really the only big change that I made to big change that I made to the original pattern is I used flat felled seams everywhere, um, which is really easy to convert to most patterns uh, if they have a 5 8 inch seam allowance, uh, because you can do flat felled seams with that seam allowance pretty easily. Um, so this vest has these really big, deep pockets, which is great for putting all of the basil in right now um but the garden's getting tomatoes so pretty soon these pockets will be full of tomatoes which is exciting uh yeah it's very handy to throw on to go outside with the dog um so i can carry my phone and my keys with me to take the dog out without having to put on the actual like jeans if it's first thing in the morning. Very useful. I will get a lot of use out of this and I'm very pleased with how it turned out. On to works in progress. There's not a ton to talk about here. Uh, it's been a lot of not doing things or doing very small amounts of things, but I have made a little bit of progress to talk to you about. I have been working on my Comfort Fade Cardi, which is a pattern by Andrea Mowry using Once Upon a Corgi yarns. I finished one sleeve, so I have all my numbers, and I have started my second sleeve. This is the wrong side of the fabric, but it is easier to knit in the round than it is to purl in the round, so I'm making the sleeves inside out. You can see I've woven in a bunch of ends 
and all the ends are sticking out on the stockinette side. So progress is chugging along with this cardigan. I'm um, using US 4 3.5 millimeter needles. Um, they're my Chiagu interchangeables, and that needle almost came off just now. One of them keeps on twisting. And that's steady work. I've also been working on my blue coned yarn boxy sweater. I will put a video here of what the piece I'm working on looks like. Um, I had shown you the little sleeves and I think I've shown you the back which is a rectangle. I'm working on the front piece. Uh, as of recording I have 60 more rows of the pattern to go before I can scrap it off flip it around and then do the stockinette shaping for the neckline um, because I'm doing it in a tuck stitch pattern and for tuck stitch patterns the purl side is the right side and it would just be easier and I would appreciate the mental stability of scrapping it off before I do any shaping because it's a lot of rows. I've also started a new thing. It's not going to be a big project. I'm using um, Mina Phillips pinwheel scrap blanket pattern to make some uh, pinwheel squares. I've not even finished a quarter of a square. Um, I've been doing a smidge of work on my Cozy Memories blanket and I'm still working through my self-made advent calendar minis and these minis are huge so I am whatever's left of those minis I am holding double I'm using a US 4 3.5 millimeter um, cubics circular needle and I'm doing some pinwheel scrap squares I'm 80% sure what I'm gonna do is eight squares total. So four of them together, so four of them together, and put some kind of a, an I-cord or a braided tie on them and use them as seat covers in my car because I spill things on the seats of my car. Um, <laughs> I need something to cover them. So that's a pretty casual project. It was just a, a day where I needed to be doing something new, but I wasn't really committed to starting a very large new project. Uh, I have started a new cross stitch project. It's relatively simple. It's one color on black 14 count Ada fabric. It is the Jedi Order symbol. I'm working on this ring around the symbol and then this will be filled in sort of a mindless shape. I will probably just display this on a hoop. Um, but I have this pattern so it's relatively easy for me to do while things are difficult. Um, and then I've got one sewing project that I'm actively working on. I'm trying to get my craft room to a place where the quilt that I'm working on is at a good pausing point so that I can make one or both of the shirts from my Make 9. But I saw this tutorial somewhere possibly on Tumblr, on how to create a pattern from a, an item of clothing that you already have and like the fit of. So I have this green button-down shirt. It's a store-bought shirt. 
It had been in my mending pile for ages because it a button came off in the dryer and it just took me 10,000 years to replace that button. Uh, but I wore it again recently and I really like, much like, no, not even this shirt, although this shirt is good too, but I really noticed how the armholes fit on this shirt as opposed to the gray button down shirt that I've made. Um, the armholes in that shirt are deeper than these armholes and these armholes are more comfortable. So I've been following that tutorial to draft a pattern from this shirt and it's very easy to do. You take some painter's tape and you basically cover a piece of the shirt. You go right up to the seam line, cover a piece of the shirt, remove it, and then stick it to some paper or if you have scrap um, wrapping paper, that would be a great use for it. Um, I think I've got all the pattern pieces. Some are tape replicas and some of them are like the collar and the neckband and the um, the front bands and the cuffs and the plackets are from the simplicity shirt pattern that I've made before but this is what my big pattern pieces look like I did the outline of each piece in the one inch blue tape and then took some thicker tape and just went straight over it carefully peeled it off and then stuck it to this is some um, craft paper that I got from the dollar store ages ago so um, so this is the front of the shirt and that's just I just left the pocket um, so that I had something to mark uh, where the pocket placement is um, and I um, cut out a piece using the other shirt pattern for the actual pocket itself but I left this as a placement and so I didn't have a weird bump in the tape but uh, yeah the painters tape doesn't leave any residue on your clothes and this needs to be washed anyway so it was an interesting process you definitely get fewer straight lines than uh, out of the out of the envelope paper patterns uh, but that's because as you wear your clothes, they kind of conform to you a bit. So, um, so yeah, like this edge is not straight, but neither is my body. So we'll see how that goes. I'll do one shirt using, um, these pattern pieces, see how it fits at the end. I added this space outside of the blue tape is five eighths seam allowance so that I can either do regular seams and finish them off or do flat filled seams um, depending on how successful even making this shirt is but yeah kind of mindless to do an execution while you're doing the taping and then afterwards trying to figure things out. It's a little more complex, so it's been a good combination project for me at the moment. And my notes fell asleep. I only have one other thing to talk about on this podcast, uh, and it's real brief because I haven't really been talking about other stuff. Um, but I have one item in other stuff, and that's stuff I'm listening to at the recommendation of what seems like the entire reading knitting community and also every everyone in my real life and my mother uh, has been reading the Court of Thorns and Roses series by Sarah J. Mass. Um, so I joined a new audiobook service. It's called Audiobooks Now. Um, I wanted to try something different than Audible because I don't think Amazon needs my dollars. Um, but I was trying it out 
figured might as well get that book and listen to it. Um, it was good. It didn't wow me. There was a huge stretch in the middle listening to it that was the most boring thing in the world. Um, and all I kept thinking during that whole middle part while Pharaoh was falling in love with Tamlin, which is literally all that's happening for hours of the audiobook. Probably five hours of the audiobook. It's just her falling in love with Tamlin. All I kept thinking was this would be a hell of a lot more interesting if Tamlin was a woman and this was a queer relationship. That's, I mean, think about it. Feyre had her friend in the village that she tumbled with sometime, but she wasn't all that into him and didn't really care about boys. And then she goes into the Fey land and would be suddenly enamored with the beauty of this Lady Tamlin. And she was like, oh, I have feelings. That's not, <laughs> that was not interesting as a straight relationship, but would be a hell of a lot more interesting as a queer one, is all I'm saying. Um, yeah, I'll probably listen to the rest of the series, uh, but I'm gonna see if I can borrow them instead of purchase them. Because it did get interesting at the end, but I'm wary of the next book falling into the same pattern of interesting in the beginning, long stretches of hetero nonsense, and then some action at the end. Which is, is my impression from talking to a couple of people that that's how these books go. I just don't want to pay for that long stretch of hetero nonsense in the middle. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, but that's gonna do it for this episode. I don't know when the next episode will happen. There is some family stuff going on at the time of filming right now, and I don't know... how things are going to shake down in the next coming weeks. So we'll see what happens. Um, but as a reminder, show notes and everything are over at freakishlemon.com. Come join the group on Ravelry. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab. You'll find us. You'll be able to follow me as Freakish Lemon. Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Ravelry. Uh, links to these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you want to subscribe so that you know when I post th the next video, just hit that subscribe button here on YouTube and that's going to do it for me. Goodbye. <laughs>